you can hit me with the words you flee. Not in the studio today because SCMP is on lockdown. The the, uh, the whole office is closed. So I'm at home and I've, I've still got John because he's always there in his house. So nothing's changed over in Korea. But John, uh, thanks for joining me again, man. Uh, we're here to break down UFC Fight Night, Kato versus Ige. Yeah, uh, we've, we've had a huge card on the weekend. I guess it's a little bit like of a, a come down after that Masvidal Usman stuff, but still a good show, isn't it? Uh, a nice main event. Let's start with that main event, Calvin Cato versus Dan Ige. Just wanted to get your predictions, your picks, your analysis. How do you see that fight going? Man, I, I don't want to underestimate Dan Ige because that's the, the easy thing to do right here is, you know, underestimate him. He's a, he's a guy that doesn't have that that name value yet, but he's a tough fight, you know, for anybody in that top ten, and I think he actually is ranked at number ten. You know, after that after that fight, after that tough fight against Edson Barboza, he pulled out the decision, and uh, he's coming in here as the big big underdog, and he's gonna try to take the shine of Calvin Cater. Calvin Cater, he's a beast, man. His last couple of fights. He's done really, really well against the top guys. Uh, that St- uh, Jeremy Stevens knockout, that standing elbow, you know, that's that's a highlight reel of dreams right there. And uh, Calvin Cater, I feel like he's one of those dark horses. You know, Ige's probably the dark horse, but then there's the dark horses that are up up in the division, and Calvin Cater is one of them next to Josh Emmett. And uh, this is going to be a hard fight for Ige, but I don't, I don't know if. Calvin Cater is going to be able to take out Ige, though. I don't know if he's going to be able to finish Ige. A lot of people are predicting that, you know, Calvin Cater has the the stand up to knock out Ige, but man, he's a tough guy. He's a Hawaiian. How many Hawaiians have you seen get <laughs> knocked out? Not many. We just saw last weekend uh, Max Holloway. Man, he. I don't think he's ever been knocked out, and uh, and I think Ige is not going to get out. I think this close is going to be a lot more competitive than uh, than people uh, are forecasting. But I still see Calvin Cater pulling it out, man. If you see them in the face-off, Calvin Cater, like physically, he's just much taller, uh, much longer, much rangier. And he's actually fought against much, much tougher competition. And I always look at that. I always look at experience. And going into this fight, Calvin Cater has that experience. And he has the the the, the mindset, I feel. And if, if Dan Ige could come in there, and knock off Calvin Cater, man. That's that's huge. That's that'll put ripples through this division, and uh, yeah. But I'm going with Cater in this fight. I feel like it's going to go to the decision. It's going to be a five round war because Ige is going to be so tough that he's going to take shots, but he's going to keep coming and coming and coming. And if he, if Cater doesn't, you know, match that um, pace, you might see Ige pull through at the the last couple of rounds. I'm just saying, but yeah, I'll take Cater in this one. What do you got? Look, I'm bringing it up on screen here with Tapology. Yeah. Uh, let's get your thoughts. Look at the odds. What have we got? All right. Yeah. Um, underdog. Ige's the underdog. Calvin Gates yeah. a moderate favorite. I don't know, man. Like, I always defer to you guys, you and Chris, you the experts here. I just ask the questions, but uh, I'll trust whatever JHK says. Uh, I, I'm going to go for Cater. I don't know. That's my, my gut feeling. But, it's always good to go for the 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 favorites, you know. Like favorites <laughs> usually win, right? In in betting, and uh, unless you know something that you know that the favorite has an injury or something crazy, most of the time you go for the favorite because nine out of ten times the favorite's gonna win. Yeah, I mean, apart from that poor guy who bet two hundred thousand dollars on <laughs> Masvidal to beat Usman. Oh my God! What a bet! Yeah, uh, right. but did you see that Fanjo were paying out on Max Holloway losing because they yeah. they gave everyone their money back or whatever for betting on Holloway after that Volkanovski got the decision? That's crazy. That right? is so idiotic of that company <laughs> to At do least that. It's honest though. Well, it's well you well from now moving forward, it's going to be like every decision that you know people don't agree with. Are they going to pay back the money? Is that what's going to happen? Because now, I don't, I don't know what they're trying to do, FanDuel. I think, are they trying to do some publicity with this? Trying to get people to come and bet more with them? Or are they really feeling like Max Holloway won that fight? Because I feel Max Holloway, that was a close fight, man. It wasn't, it wasn't controversial. It wasn't a robbery. You know what I mean? Like, it, if Max had won, okay. Valk won, okay. It's like It's not like, oh my God, Max won four rounds, five rounds. 
and and then they gave Valk the decision. I don't understand FanDuel. That that makes no sense. Yeah, Who's the CEO? You better fire him because he's gonna lose that company a lot all of money. I know, all I know is Dana mentioned it in his scrum with uh, every all the media mm-hmm. in uh, Abu Dhabi. So feels like there's a possibility he wanted to drum up some kind of interest in that because you know Dana was very outspoken about that decision. He he kind of hinted he he definitely thought Holloway won. So. Who knows? But anyway, let's move down this card. Uh, I'll bring it back up on screen. Co-main event. Uh, it's not a great card, is it? <laughs> With all due respect to everyone. Tim Elliott, Ryan Benoit. Benoit, Benoit or Benoit? How do we say it, man? I don't even know. Benoit. Gary Tony is telling me it's Benoit. Yeah, but you've got a bunch yeah. of people saying it's Benoit. Uh, let's say Ryan Benoit. Yeah, all right. Co-main event to Americans. Uh, number 17, flyweight. I mean, yeah. What, what do you... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> swearing there sorry yeah it's it's it is it is what it is isn't it uh what do you make is this is this going to be a good kind of co-main event or it's, what it's a good matchup you know um it's confusing why this fight yeah. would be the co-main event but it is a good matchup um tim elliott let me give you some backstory on him he's coming into this fight i believe on a three fight losing streak but the crazy part is after the third fight after his last fight the ufc Resigned him and gave him a raise, which is unheard of. You know what I mean? But they gave it to him, and he's coming back, kind of refreshed. and And I feel like this is a good matchup for him to come back and snap that streak. He has the skill set. If you looked at the faceoffs, just like the Cater and Ige fight, Tim Elliott is way taller and way longer. And one thing about Tim Elliott, he's very scrappy. He moves around a lot. He's good in the scrambles. And I feel like this fight's going to be a lot of scrambles going on on the ground, in the stand-up, everywhere. Ryan Benoit, you remember him? He fought um, uh, Alatang. He lost to Alatang in his last fight in Pusan, right? And that was at 135. This fight is at 125. So um, I don't know what the weight cut has done to Ryan Benoit, but I don't see him coming in here with uh with the advantage what's the odds in this fight well yeah slight favorite for tim elliott mm-hmm. near under sorry near even for ryan benoit but i don't know man as you did you see those weigh-ins there was a few misses weren't there and it's like a lot of yeah we'll get to those we'll get to those <laughs> yeah, we'll get to that, they're coming yeah. they're coming, <laughs> they're coming but, uh, yeah i think i'll take uh tim elliott in this fight I think Tim Elliott could get the submission victory in this fight. You know, even though Ryan Benoit trains with Gary Tonin, I see Tim Elliott possibly getting into one of those scrambles and being able to grab a neck, you know, grab his neck and and, and squeeze hard and then probably get the tap. We'll see what happens. Is Gary Tonin in on Fight Island right now? Yeah, he is. I think he's also okay. cornering uh, Jared Gordon. Is that correct? I may be wrong, but I, I've been no, told that's he's... Paul Felder, right? Yeah, F- Felder and, T- I mean, our freelancer oh, Matt okay. Scott was saying that Tonin's going to be doing Gordon as well. But oh. I said he's he's definitely going to be cornering Benoit because obviously, yeah, he was there in Korea when we were there. But who knows? We'll have to clear that one out with Gary. But um, yeah. maybe I'll – yeah, we'll, we'll find out. Okay. Uh, Jimmy Rivera against Cody Stamen. Who you got there? Okay, this should be the co-main event. Jimmy Rivera yeah. versus Cody Stamen. <laughs> Both guys, top 10, band weights. Um, Jimmy Rivera hasn't had the the best run in the last couple of fights. And uh, I, I'm taking Cody Stamen in this one. I feel Cody Stamen all around skill set is better than Jimmy Rivera. Even though Jimmy R- Rivera has faced the top of the, the division, but he's pretty much lost to most of them. He's lost to Peter Yan. Uh, I feel he's lost to Sterling, you know, a couple of the guys up there. And Cody Stamen is a guy that's building himself up. And he's moving up quickly, and this is a great matchup. And one thing that's good, one thing that's unique about this fight, both these guys are top ten in one thirty-five, but they're fighting at one forty-five because they announced this fight, I, I believe, a week out, two weeks out. So these guys came in; they don't have to cut as much weight. And uh, I see, Ryan, I see Cody Stamen winning uh, a decision against Jimmy Rivera. It's a bit of a quick turnaround, isn't it, though, for Cody? He, he was only fighting a few weeks ago in Jacksonville, right? Exactly, exactly. It is. Uh, he had that emotional fight, but I feel that he's going to take that emotion, man. He, he did well in the, in the fight that he, you know, he had a couple weeks back, and I feel like that was kind of like a, a warm-up for him. And this one is going to be a real scrap, and these guys are going to go at it, and, and, and it's going to be 
a long, hard fight. These guys have always have long, hard fights. It's never quick and easy for these guys. So uh, we're going to expect some uh, some uh, good, good exchanges in this fight. But I feel Cody will be a one step faster, one step stronger. And, uh, yeah, he's going to probably get it done in this one and, and move up the rankings, which is weird because they're fighting at 145. <laughs> There's a few Brits on this card, right? Uh, we got Meatball, Molly McCann uh, against Taylor Santos. Uh, what do you make of this one? Let me bring up on screen here. Okay. Yeah. Um, again, not the not the the best fight, but uh, yeah, decent, right? I, I think she, uh, Molly's Molly's uh, one to watch always. Yeah, she's aggressive. She's feisty. Um, uh, her opponent Santos, man, she's she's coming off a debut loss, right? Split decision loss to uh, Mara Romero Borella, and to be honest with you, Borella is not that good, and Santos lost to her. I feel like Molly McCann's is, you know, a few steps up in competition, and Molly McCann's gonna get it done. She's on. She has some momentum coming into this fight too. You know, what I mean, I think she's she's on a three fight win streak, and uh, I think she finished a couple of those fights too. Let me let me check real fast. No, actually, she didn't finish anybody. She 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 has three straight unanimous decisions. So I can see this going unanimous decision for Molly McCann's, and it's not gonna be. The most entertaining fight, but Molly's going to get it done and uh, move up the rankings. Basically, that's what's going to happen for her. Yeah, always a bit of hype behind the Brits, right? Uh, so <laughs> we'll see how Molly does. The female, but, uh, there's not many females out there, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, um, yeah, the opener on this this main card is interesting because uh, obviously, yeah, yeah, you know, uh, Munir Lazarus, he he's um he's been doing his thing in uh, UAE Warriors, is that right? Uh, he he beat our guy Sasha Palatnikov from Hong Kong. So yeah, uh, you've been telling me this is one guy to watch out for, and um, he's definitely dangerous. I've seen a few like that. There was a big head kick finish uh, a few years ago from Munir. Um, I know, I know, there was a weight cut issue though here. So let's just get your thoughts on the the matchup first. Okay, so Munir, he is the human highlight reel. Like yes. all of his fights <laughs> are highlight reel knockouts, and that's why he got signed. the The story was that he somebody showed Dana White his highlight reel, and Dana signed him off that. and And that's incredible, man. And I'm glad he's getting his chance in the UFC. I've been following Munir for the past two or three years so i've seen him kind of grow but man he's tall he's long and he's powerful and he's gonna produce this is the fight this is the sleeper fight on this card this is the one that's gonna produce a knockout there's gonna be a performance bonus going out to either one of these guys and munir has that you know ability to do it but his opponent also comes in he's all powerful i think he's on a three fight win streak all knockouts uh, I think all in the first round. But the problem with him is, first, he missed weight, I think, by four pounds. And second, he's coming off a three-year layoff, two- or three-year layoff because of the, uh, what is it, that, the, the rape allegations, right? And he yes. fought those, and, and he was found innocent. So I'm glad, you know, that worked out for him. But um, I, w I wonder where he is mentally, you know what I mean? Like, coming, you know, going through all of that in your life and then coming back and having to fight against one of the top – fighters in the world that's that's a heavy duty right there and uh and he missed weight so maybe that that has that could play a factor in it but uh man i'm taking Munir in this fight i think he's gonna come in and he's gonna he's gonna surprise a lot of people he's gonna do you know what uh michelle Pereira ferrera did you know the the guy that does the flips He's yeah. going to do something crazy, and uh, and he's going to get the knockout, I think, in this fight. Uh, Abdul, he's a guy that's kind of wild, and he swings from the fences. But, man, I think Munir is just going to be just too fast, and and he's just going to be one step quicker at getting his punches through the face. That's basically it, and that's what's going to happen. He's going to get a knockout. Uh, but this fight is going to be exciting, though. Well, Abdul... Forfeiting twenty percent of his purse uh, to Munir wasn't the only miss, was it? You had Chris, sorry, Chris Fishgold is going to forfeit twenty percent of his purse to Jared Gordon. 
Uh, there were a bunch of misses here. Uh, and then, yeah, Kenneth Berg been ruled medically unfit to compete against uh, Hawaiian Gonzalez. Uh, it's just, you know, you, you don't want to have three things like this, do you, on one card? You, you kind of beg maybe there might be one, but, yeah, it's it's a bit of a mess. And then there's there's been so many coronavirus pro- positive tests just been like, the UFC is doing their best, but... I think things are catching up to them when you know, when you bring people in on short notice like this, they can't make weight, can they? Is that the issue? It it could be the issue. Also, it could be being quarantined for forty eight hours before they leave, and then when they arrive, they're quarantined another forty eight hours. That could mess with their weight cut. Um, I remember watching a, an interview, Chris Fishgold interview, when he was qu- quarantining in London before he's taken off. And he was complaining about the food and it's not good for his weight cut. And I guess it really wasn't because he missed weight and now he has to forfeit 20%. Um, I don't, I, right now under the circumstances, I don't feel like uh, missing weight is that big of a deal. Not as, not as big as it used to be, you know, because right now they're flying. Like I said, they're in quarantine 48 hours and then get there 48 hours to quarantine again. Man, you just got to kind of, give them a pass somewhat. You can't dig too deep into the wound because they they miss weight. They lose money. And, you know, fighters, they're fighters. They lose money. That's, that's you know, that's a big deal for them, for anybody that fights. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't want to, like, dwell on it too much, but I don't think it's going to have a huge factor on the, the result of the fight or the outcome of the fight. Uh, but if you look at the prelims, there's a couple guys there that uh, I feel like you should look out for. The first guy is uh, Jack Shore. He's he's actually the first fight of the night. He was supposed to fight um, a Brazilian, Anderson Dos Santos, but Anderson Dos Santos tested positive, so they brought in John Aaron Phillips. And Aaron Phillips actually fought in the UFC a few years back when he was, I believe, 24 years old, but now he's a little bit older. He's on a five, six fight win streak, and he's matured. And he's coming in with a whole new different mentality. And and I interviewed actually both of these guys. So, you know, I know a little bit more of uh, their, their kind of like their camps. And, and, you know, nothing's normal coming in here. None of these guys are having normal camps. So I feel but but I feel like Aaron Phillips, he's going to he's going to do well. But I, I think Jack Shore is one of those uh, big prospects, one of the next wave of prospects from the U.K., and he's gonna get this. He's gonna get the job done in this fight. And so keep an out, out, eye out on uh, Jack Shore. Uh, another guy is, um, or another, actually not even another guy. Another fight you should be looking out for is uh, uh, Ricardo Ramos versus Laram Murphy. That's gonna be a, a hell of a fight. It's it's probably the second sleeper fight of the night behind Munir and uh, and uh, what's his, what's the other guy's name? Abdul, right? But these two guys, they're. Um, they're, they're, the stylistically, it's a good matchup. Uh, Ricardo Ramos, I interviewed him. He's saying that he's going to get the arm bar finish. He called an arm bar finish in this fight, which is pretty crazy. And uh, Laurent Murphy, I believe he said he's going to go for the knockout. So we'll see who's, uh, whose predictions play out in this fight. But it's going to be a hell of a fight. I like this one. It's going to be fun. Uh, Modestas uh, Bukaskas. He's a big uh, prospect coming out the UK. Also, uh, he's a cage war- former Cage Warriors champion. He's making his UFC debut. You should look out for him. Uh, and he has a tough test against uh, Adrianus Mikolakis. I think I'm saying that right. You know, but uh, yeah, that's that should be a good fight right there too. Uh, Jared Gordon's on here. You know, he always brings it, uh, and he's dropping back down. Or yeah, he's dropping back down to 145 against Chris Fishgold. That should be interesting to see, you know, how that plays out with the weight cut and everything. But I interviewed Jared Gordon too, and he told me that uh, he he was he was he stayed too long at lightweight, and that kind of messed with his record. And now it's he, he kind of has his uh, back to the wall in this fight, you know, like because he didn't do so well in his last couple fights at lightweight. So we'll see what happens in this one. It should go to the ground. These guys, Chris Fishko loves to grapple. He loves to he loves submissions. Jared Gordon the same way. So it should go to the ground and, and someone should get a finish there. Uh, but other than that, man, you know, there's a guy named Ka- Kam- Kamzat Chimiaev. Like there's a there's a video of him sparring. He's undefeated. He's making his debut. There's a video of him sparring Alexander Gustafsson and dropping him. Have you seen that highlight? 
I have not seen the highlight, but now I want to go see it because he's yeah, Swedish so, as well. Yeah, yeah, he is Swedish, but I guess he trains over there with all those guys. And uh, yeah, he's he's supposed to be a tough prospect. You know, if if a, a video of him in sparring dropping Gustafsson with a body shot is flowing around, you know, he must be decent, right? So we'll see what happens in that fight against uh, John Phillips, another guy from the UK. A lot of UK guys, you know, a lot of UK guys and girls on this card. Yeah, flying the flag for the UK. Why not? Um, okay, well, cheers for your analysis, always, John. Um, I, I guess we could also talk a little bit about uh, one championship have announced finally the full card, I think, for their, their first show back. Uh, it's been about four or five months. I think the last show was February uh, in Singapore, King of the Jungle. And my, uh, many of the same people on that card are going to be on this one. We've got Stamp Fairtex, it looks like. Uh, let me bring it up here. Uh, yeah, it's very Muay Thai heavy. It's it's in Bangkok. It makes sense, right? Because they're going to need people who were just there already to fight, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, definitely. But I heard something about that they have a few more fights on on this card. They just didn't put it up on on this poster. This is what I'm hearing from uh from the the Twitterverse, right? From from a, a manager in in the Twitterverse. It says uh, they're saying that their their fighter is on there. Uh, so we'll see what happens. You know, six fights. Hey, it's better than nothing. And there's some crazy strikers on here that that uh. Rod Tang versus uh, what is Pesh. it? Pet, yeah. pet them, pet them, right? Man, that's gonna be a crazy fight. Like I'm, I know about the the Muay Thai and the, the kickboxing somewhat, but uh, and I'm not no expert in it. You know what I mean? I'm not gonna go into detail about the uh to, about every fighter on the roster, but this fight, I know both these guys, and it's gonna be crazy um the the co-main event you know you got a stamp on there it's a fight if you put it on in bangkok people are going to go and watch it because it's going to be mostly ties and uh and uh, uh the opener of the night which is uh mark oliberto versus uh what is it fabricio andrage i know fabricio man i've known him for a few years now and uh he's been fighting in china for um wlf and I feel he also fought for Kulun. Uh, he, he he does a lot of kickboxing, but uh, he, he had a few MMA fights, and, and he's making his debut on this card against Mark. And Mark is a beast. I'm And, and, and Fabricio is a striker. These guys, and and uh, Fabricio represents Tiger Muay Thai. Mark Oliveira represents Fairtex uh, fight, uh, fight team. It's, you know, what, what else better, man? Like, you got two of the best teams in Thailand. And then two young prospects, and they're both strikers. Someone's getting knocked out, and it's gonna be fun to watch. I, th I feel like there's gonna be a lot of uh, finishes on this card because it's all basically kickboxing. So, and uh, Muay Thai. So we'll see what happens. But uh, I'm I'm gonna watch it. Are you gonna watch it? I'm watching it live. You know, I'm gonna be there. I'm gonna watch it. Yeah, I uh, wish I could be there. I feel like I might get to travel there before the third wave of coronavirus hit uh, the uh, Hong Kong. Sorry. Because uh, Hong Kong was talking about opening up a travel bubble with Thailand, but uh, that won't happen anymore because we're popping 50 new cases a day apparently now in Hong Kong. So, yeah, as I was saying, like, everything's shut down here. That's why I'm, I'm stuck at home. I'm, uh, the office is closed. Everything's closed. The gyms are closed. So, uh, sorry, John, I can't be getting that six pack like I keep promising. You know, so, <laughs> um, let me remove this from the screen. I just wanted to bring up this. Um, Message Chattery shared, uh, CEO of One Championship Chattery, okay. Sid Song. Uh, he, so apparently there's 10 shows in the works through the end of October. I don't know if you can see this on the screen. First one is okay. July 31st. Yeah, yeah, three in August, three in September, then three in October. Very few details actually given, uh, but I'm led to believe all these shows are going to be in Singapore and Thailand. So make of that what you will. It sounds like... They may be a limited pool of talent. Uh, they will not be flying in the champions, I guess, from the U.S. A lot of the champs live there, right? Like Angela Lee, Christian Lee, Demetrius Johnson. He's not a champ, sorry, but he's, he's going to challenge for the flyweight title there. Even Adriano lives in Florida, the, the actual flyweight champ. Uh, Bibiano lives in Seattle, or is it uh, up in Canada? Very close. Um, yeah, one championship. It's still a difficult situation, isn't it? Oh, it's 
it's a extreme situation um i'm i'm thinking that they're being very optimistic with these dates you know and and putting cards together it's going to it's going to allow a lot of fighters that probably would never have a chance of getting signed to one championship being able to fight for one championship now cuz you know a little bird in the tree told me that they're scouring they're scouring for fighters you know they they're they're going out and looking for fighters to sign all over Thailand I'm pretty sure in Singapore and and I just I don't know the 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 details of the the travel bubbles but most likely if there is a travel bubble with Thailand they're probably going to that country that they have a travel bubble with and and putting uh finding fighters there is because they could fly over just like uh singapore so we'll see what happens with that i also heard that they might even have a show in japan too in one of those dates so um we'll see what happens you know japan i think that their cases are going up at the moment uh and but they do have travel bubbles with other countries though so um i don't know it's it's, it's going to be hard to put on like these major cards, you know, like people expected this year, it's going to be very hard, very difficult. You know, you mentioned earlier, all the major fighters, the stars live abroad. They don't even live in Asia. Who's the biggest star that lives, actually lives in Asia and trains in Asia. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's mostly the fighters in Thailand, but you're going to put stamp on every card. (laughs) <laughs> you could have put stab on every that's like one of the major stars right you know for one day she was on in december she was on in january i think she was on in october or november but eventually you can no longer do that right yeah and then you, you know you're gonna you're gonna be exhausted you're gonna exhaust your resources and then stamp's gonna end up fighting somebody that you know probably shouldn't be in be in the cage with her and then she's gonna yeah. be so exhausted or injury ridden that she's gonna lose to some you know fighter that's probably just a a decent prospect at the most and and you don't want that situation for your superstars so uh it's it's very interesting to to follow what exactly one championship is going to do to fill these cards but i have faith in them though those guys work hard those people that work at one championship they're very dedicated to their craft man and and uh and i'm glad that they're coming back because we need to work man they need to work and fighters need to get paid so let's do it yeah, there's a little media day tomorrow. I've got Rod Tang, I think, and I've got Stam Fairtex on Friday. So looking forward to catch up with everyone in one. Uh, anything else in the MMA world today, John? Uh, it's pretty quiet after Fight Island. Well, sorry, the first show in Fight Island. Obviously, there's another one tomorrow, but just a little bit of... What about, the, what about the, 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 the Venom deal? You know, I don't think we talked yeah, about that. Any. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Well, you know... Uh, See, what do you think? I think Venom have been sponsoring a few athletes in one championship, right? But it's that individual sponsorship. It's not uh, a company-wide deal, right? Yeah, it's individual. And, and Venom also sponsors a lot of boxers. Uh, I feel Venom sponsors Lomachenko. Lomachenko is the one of the major names that they sponsor. So so they got boxing and, and they got uh, kickboxing, Muay Thai, and MMA fighters and and you've seen Venom for a long long time you know from back in the day in the UFC it goes back I think 10 years or more uh fighters wearing Venom Jose Aldo wore Venom for a long time the Korean Zombie was sponsored by Venom for a while you know all their shorts before the Reebok deal came along a lot of them were Venom shorts uh they're a staple in combat sports uh they're well respected their 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 apparel is worn all over the place you see people wearing it you know all the time uh but the only there's a lot of questions though you know like to to this deal you know remember when the Reebok deal got signed and then Dana White said that most of the money that they're signing <laughs> with Reebok is going to go to the fighters and i saw something i don't know if it's a legit statistics but i saw something that 70 million was supposed to go to the fighters but at this point, this year, and the Venom deal or, or the Reebok deal is done next year, right in in February, that only forty one million has gone to the fighters. So are they going to pay the fighters the rest of the twenty nine million in the next few months? I don't like. I don't understand what, how that's going to work out. I, I hope they do. He said he got three thousand dollars from the deal, which is nothing, right? <laughs> it's nothing. That's nothing, you know. And then so and then would- the, the 
why don't we let everyone just have their own individual deal? Because that's how it should be. It's how it is in tennis, you know, those kind of sports where you have individuals competing against each other, not on a team or a club or a franchise. You've got Djokovic, uh, used to be with Uniqlo. I can't remember. I think it's with Lacoste now. Murray used to be Fred Perry. Then he was Adidas. Uh, Federer was, oh, I can't remember anymore. But they, they would get these, you know, multi-million dollar deals just to wear this kit. And it looked great. And they would drive sales for the individual company. They all made more money. It's just in the interest of the fighter, isn't it? Why sign everyone to a, a deal where they're, they're trapped? I don't get it. But obviously, it's a, bit, a part of a bigger issue, isn't it, fighter pay in the UFC? It, it is part of the bigger issue. And also, the TV deal uh, is tied into that. Uh, does, you, does ESPN want guys wearing shorts with random sponsors, you know, across the the rear end of a fighter like a lot of people point to the condom depot you know do you want a condom depot ad on the back of a shorts on espn but you know the ufc could regulate you know which sponsors you have you know what i mean like it's not like they have to uh let people get sponsored by because i've heard the ufc block sponsors because they have to take a percentage of the the fighter sponsorships right when they come in into the cage when they did have their own sponsors so you know they could regulate i don't you know like i like venom uh but i don't feel like the the, the fighters are going to benefit from it so i'm not a, a a big proponent of an apparel deal with the ufc and venom i'm, I'm not gonna cheer that deal on and and they said that they're gonna f- pay the fighters off or pay the fighters more in this deal but that's what they said in the last deal. So how do we even believe what they're saying right now? And I, I want the fighters to have their own sponsor. I want them to have their own shorts. You know, like you said, in tennis, you know, individual sports where you're an independent contractor, contractor, why are you not independently being able to find your own sponsors then? Why do you have to go with their sponsors? You know, like if, if, if you have a Venom deal, why don't you just let those guys, the fighters, have like five other sponsors that they could put on their shorts and the shorts are venom you know make make a compromise but there is no compromise it's like you're gonna wear venom and you know what sucks about the venom deal they're not gonna even get shoes the fight kids probably won't even have shoes at least reebok had shoes right (laughs) remember when matt mitrione had to do a media day uh a back i think it was like a fight night or something like that a few years back. This was during the Reebok deal and he was wearing a pair of Jordans and you know what they did? The UFC, they made him take off his shoes and he had to go into the media room barefooted and do all his interviews because he couldn't wear, cause he had to wear the Reebok stuff. And I was just like, man, but the only thing that, I, that sucks for the fighters is that they're probably not going to get any shoes out of it. You know what I mean? Unless Venom making shoes. I know that they make boxing, sh- you know, like boxing shoes. I don't know if they're called shoes or whatever, but uh, I know they make boxing shoes. Are they going to make boxing shoes, give boxing shoes, a pair of boxing shoes to everybody? And that's going to cost a lot of money. I think those boxing shoes cost pretty, pretty hefty amount of money to make. So I don't know, man. Like, you know, I want to get, you know, the fighters, you know, uh, opinions of it. And I'm pretty sure they're all the same. They're just like, man, they're just, you know, they're just taking it because there's no choice. You know, there's no. You know, it goes all the way back to, like you said, fighter pay, unions, and all this. Like, it's a long road, right? Uh, but uh, someone's going to start it, you know. We talk, us talking about it is good, but it's not. it doesn't take us to start it. It takes the fighters, you know. It takes, like, the leaders in that, you know, in the community of, of fighters, like John Jones. John Jones should be starting his own union. If he's really serious about it, he shouldn't just sit out. He should start a union, you know, and be the, the be the face. I think he could turn around his image 180 degrees if he did that. You know, all that stuff that he did in the past, yes, that's terrible things. But if he came out and was the face of a union, a fighters union against the UFC, man, he will go down as one of the greatest individuals in the sport, right? But it's never gonna happen, man. He's he's managed by the same people that managed Masvidal. Come on. Well, you saw what happened with Masvidal. He was exactly. one of those guys holding out. He got what he wanted, and then he was happy to fight. And who can blame him, man? Good for him. But I don't know, a couple of points on Venom about those shoes. If Venom don't make shoes, maybe the UFC is a little bit less testy on people wearing Nikes or Nikes. Sorry. <laughs> I, I hope so. 
pronounce it different in the UK. Sorry. Uh, yeah. So may, maybe hopefully fighters won't get stripped of their shoes in media days. But also, what is that going to mean for one championship? Because I know a lot of their fighters are sponsored by Venom. Um, I don't know if it's, yeah, like a company one thing, but do you think that means that, that maybe Venom is going to dial back from one? And uh, I think one also, Eddie Alvarez used to say, I, I made more from one year, I think he said, with Venom than I made in my entire UFC career from that Reebok deal. So what goes on there? Yeah, I don't think uh, it does anything with Venom. Venom has deals in place outside of one championship. I'm just wondering, how, is Venom that valuable of a company? Do they have that kind of money? Do they have hundreds of millions of dollars? To I don't, I don't know how big Venom is. I didn't think that they were that big. I felt like they were a big company in the combat sports world, but I didn't think they were like a Reebok-sized company. You know what I mean? That also confuses me about Reebok. It's like... This deal seemed like it worked out for Reebok. Is Reebok in trouble? Are they tanking? They could they not afford the UFC anymore? That that opens up another conversation too, right? I I feel like Reebok. It always seemed it just wasn't a good fit, and this is where I, I think the UFC it would be better for them to actually just let fighters have individual sponsorships because it helps everyone. Look in tennis. If if you were Nike or Adidas, sorry Adidas, uh, <laughs> I keep pronouncing these. Yeah, we, the UK we say different. Um, if 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 you went to the ATP tour, let's say you know the the governing body or the WTA who govern like men's and women's tennis, and you said, all right, yeah, you can sponsor all your athletes with our stuff, they would probably say no because they'd be like, all right, well it'd be worth having Djokovic, worth having Federer, yada yada, Nadal, but we don't want to sponsor every like top 50 tennis player because the reality is they're not going to do much for us. So I just don't know what the logic is behind it. Um, it feels like it's handicapping it on both ends. Is it really worth the UFC having a an entire deal for their whole company? Is the money that good? And would it be better if they would just let their fighters strike their own deals because then the fighters will be more happy because they're making a little bit more money. Maybe it would quell the fight to pay debate. That's my take on it. But I am just a lowly podcast host. <laughs> I, don't think any, I don't think anything's going to quell the, the fighter pay debate because Dana White welcomes that debate. Don't you, you know, like when he interviews and someone asks him about fighter pay, he's just like, Hey, it's nothing new. We've been going through this since the beginning. So it is what it is, right? Like Max Holloway likes to say. Um, you, you make a good point, man. Like if this is an individual sport and if you always point to the fighters as in, uh, independent contractors, you should allow them to independently contract themselves out from the UFC and get, get their own sponsorships. And a lot of these guys are very marketable outside the UFC, you know, the UFC doesn't market them, but they can market themselves so much where they could get a lot of money from a lot of companies from their home country. You got to look at a lot of these guys come from countries that they're the only star in the UFC, which means that gives them a lot of opportunity to get sponsors outside of, of a, a Venom deal, right? And and they can make fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 more a fight just because of those sponsorship, but you killed that with that Venom deal, or not even the Venom deal, with the Reebok deal. And you're paying them like $3,000 and uh, and some change. And if you and I remember it was like, if you had 20 fights, you get like 15,000. It's like, who has 20 fights in the UFC? How many, you could count them on your hands, right? And toes. Come on, Jesus Christ. Like, it's very confusing to me. Uh, like, but it's it's a business and in and, and the UFC, the reason why they're doing the Venom deal, you know it is. I look at it as two things. Number one, they need a uniform to make it look legit as a sport on ESPN. And number two, the UFC funnels most of the money. You know what I mean? It's very clear. You know what I mean? They wouldn't sign this deal if they weren't making the the the, the lion's share of, of the money, right? And and it, I guess it's it's business, you know what I mean? That's what you have to say. I don't know if it's greed, because a lot of people like to throw that word around. It's, I don't think it's greed. It's just business. You know, business is about making money. If it doesn't make money, then you're not going to do it, right? And and if you let the fighters get their own sponsors, you're not going to really make that much money off that. So that's why they're probably not doing it. And, and that's the way that I look at it. But I'm not a 
economist or anything like that so i'm just spitting off the top of my dome but uh yeah man like i'm all for fighters getting their own sponsors because i think that's why they have managers what's the point even having a manager you know what i mean what negotiating your ufc contract there's a lot of fighters nowadays that negotiate their own contracts you know it doesn't take a a rocket scientist to do that so man it's i just think man it's like going back to tennis Mm-hmm. you mentioned it there like if you have a Roger Federer who is sponsored by Nike Nike is going to give him a bunch of free publicity mm-hmm. and that's good for your sport right mm-hmm. you're going to have Federer's got deals with remember like when I was a kid he had a deal with Gillette the shaving thing and the Dow's got a bunch of deals with a bunch of companies they have watch companies they have shoe companies headband companies t-shirts clothes everything rackets like five different sponsors this is five different huge companies giving you a bunch of free publicity that could make it. You don't even have to put any money into it. Like imagine if let's say Masvidal had five different sponsors, that's five companies. He's already got a couple, but like within the realm of fighting gear, things he can wear in a cage. Yeah. It's just, it, it's a backward step, I think to, to limit it to one thing. And no one's really heard of Venom, I think outside of the hardcore combat sports no community, way. as you say. So, it's not for me. It's not a good deal. I think it's a backward step when they could have made a a real change that benefited everyone. But yeah, as you said, man, it's that money is going straight to the UFC. It's not going to the fighters, in my opinion. Yeah, we'll, we'll see it. It's not like they're gonna hide it. You know, what I mean, we're gonna see how much they're gonna get paid, and the fighters will be open about it, and we'll see how it pans out. But uh, we still have a few months with Reebok. I guess you need to go. Well, I, I heard that that day that they announced the Venom deal, uh, you went to the UFC store. They were doing eighty percent off Reebok gear. So uh, maybe you could get that. You know, wait until January when they're really desperate to get rid of it and get in there, and, and maybe you'll get like a pair of Reebok shorts for uh, ten dollars. None of it looks good. I've, I've always a couple of times I've been on the store and I thought, oh, I could buy something. It all looks. I, I don't blame the UFC for changing if they if they want to keep a uniform deal. Just I think Reebok did not live up to the. No, and they started but, off on the wrong foot. Yeah, no, none that, of the fight. Remember that? Yeah, yeah. right. It's unmarketable stuff, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah it, I think you. Also, you look kind of like a jackass walking around with a yeah. fight kit on if you're not a fighter, you yeah. know? He's going to walk to the shops in a, a fight. <laughs> yeah. Unless you, it's your name, you know, like your name is the same name as the fighter, then it's kind of cool, right? Like you buy it and that's your name. But if you're walking around with McGregor and you're in, and you're Asian, it's kind of looks kind of odd, right, with the Irish flag and everything. But hopefully Venom's going Venom's gonna to do a better job at uh, individualizing the fight gear hopefully you know and and making it uh uh more marketable for the fighters i don't know man we're just spitballing here we're not venom but uh well, you know i just say i i have a pair of reebok shorts but i bought them on super discount because i think nobody was buying them so i was just like i might as well just get a pair of, of these to work out and uh, you know get them while they're hot so yeah. <laughs> we'll see what happens man <laughs> You know, it's a market they could really tap into. When you go to shows, having the merchandise store, I think when we were in Busan, I went and checked it out in um, the middle of the show. And, yeah, just there wasn't much there. I don't know. I guess it's Reebok who controls, like, the, the, the individual T-shirts as well that aren't just the fight gear. But I think when you – I guess it's, it's difficult to compare, but when you go to, like, a, a WWE event, there's – bunch of different cool t-shirts so I, I feel they're missing a trick they could really really market individual fighters better we'll see what venom does maybe they're gonna blow us out of the water who knows but um i'm with you man i, I want individual pay sorry individual <laughs> individual uh fighters able to secure their own sponsorship deals i think it's better for everyone i think it's just good for the game right we've seen it in one championship we've seen it in other promotions it works just let me earn some money on the side. If, if I can't make this money in the contract, at least allow me to support my family by striking a sponsorship deal with someone. But we could talk about it again, like it's fighter pay until the cows come home. So I, I guess John will wrap it up there unless you have anything else you want to chat about. No, man. Um, I just want to tell people watching, go uh, <laughs> check out my YouTube page and uh, check out the, some uh, the interviews 
for fight week this week and i got a bunch for next week uh the the till versus um whitaker fight and uh and definitely go check out uh the dan hooker interview on on this page on the you know (laughs) sdmp page this page push the subscribe the like and and go check out the dan hooker video uh the interview it's a great interview he he gets deep into a lot of good topics especially mcgregor poirier too uh i think it's interesting what he what he had to say about that but other than that you know nothing else enjoy the fights guys and uh we'll see you after the event yeah john did his first interview for scmp mma uh dan hooker you gotta go check it out first of many hopefully uh john uh, yeah who are you gonna do next for us come on man throw some names at me come on um hopefully we could get volkanovsky <laughs> adesanya um Maybe get triple C. I don't know. We'll we'll try to throw something out there, some some exclusives, and oh, yeah. uh, and and you know work hard, man. Work hard to represent for Asia. You know, all of Asia. It's been some good feedback on the interview, man. Everyone loves you, and uh, great stuff as always. Thanks again, John, for joining me. And yeah, hopefully everyone enjoys UFC Fight Night, Kata versus EK. Uh, I'll be watching in the early hours in Hong Kong. What time are we looking at, John? What are you? I think it's six a.m. here. Oh my god. I'm going to check it now. Yeah, I think that's the normal time. 6 a.m. there, 7 a.m. 7 a.m. here. Oh, yeah, 6 a.m. 5 a.m. if I want to watch these prelims. Okay. <laughs> Let's check with my girlfriend over there. <laughs> Let me watch at 5 a.m. Um, she probably won't. I, I'll, this, I can't go to the office. Maybe I'll put these headphones back in and uh, watch on the laptop. Yeah, anyway, guys, cheers, John. And uh, hopefully I'll see you tomorrow to recap it at some point. And uh, we'll get Chris back in. Uh, we missed Chris. Chris was busy today. But, yeah, John, John, uh, thanks again, man. And uh, everyone watching, thanks for joining us. We'll see you all again after a while. Cheers. Hey, guys, Sasha Platnikov here, letting you know to tune in to SCMP Post Fight for all your weekly martial arts news.